Today I'm going to answer the question, are all Europeans descendants of Charlemagne? And when I say European, we could actually expand that to include anyone with at least one European ancestor. So that would include most people in the Western world, even people of color, because usually there's at least one European somewhere in everyone's family tree. But the principles we're going to talk about in this video do not just apply to Europe anyway. We could change the question to, are all Asians descendants of the Tang Dynasty? Or are all Middle Easterners descendants of the Caliphs of Baghdad? So what we're really asking is whether or not every person living today is somehow related to medieval royalty. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use Charlemagne and Europeans as an example. So I'm not going to keep you in suspense. The answer, according to one theory, is yes. Everyone alive today with at least one drop of European blood is a descendant of the great King Charlemagne. And the reason I'm bringing this whole issue up is because some people like to brag about the fact that they are a distant relative of some king or queen. And what they don't realize is the fact that the same is true for just about everyone else. Now, why have I chosen to focus on Charlemagne? Well, Charlemagne is kind of the father of Europe. He lived around the year 800 and re-established an empire in Western Europe for the first time since the fall of Rome. His empire eventually evolved into the countries we now know today as France and Germany. So every royal house in medieval and modern Europe can somehow trace their roots back to Charlemagne. That's why he's at the top of my European royal family tree chart. If you can connect to any person on this tree, you can also connect to Charlemagne. So the theory that I'm going to talk about in this video is based on a paper by a Yale mathematician named Joseph Chang. His theory went on to be tested by several other experts, including some geneticists and genealogists. And the overall conclusion was that the theory seems to hold up. If you're interested in reading all of the technical details from the original sources, I'll put a bunch of links to those in the description. So the theory doesn't really have a name, but I'm going to call it the Identical Ancestors Theory. And in order to explain it to you, I'm going to go through three genealogical principles that, when taken together, result in the Identical Ancestors Theory. So principle number one is, as you go back in time, your number of ancestors increases exponentially. So here is a very basic family tree. Here's you and here are your immediate ancestors. If you go back one generation, you have exactly two ancestors, your biological father and your biological mother. If you go back another generation, you have four ancestors, your paternal grandparents and your maternal grandparents. If we keep going up, you have eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-great-grandparents, and so on. So at first glance, it appears as though the math is fairly simple. You start with two, and then you just double the number for every generation after that. So let's say we go back 10 generations. That would be 1,024 ancestors. If we go back 20 generations, that number jumps to over a million. You can see that the numbers start off small, but get really big really fast. Now, let's talk about generation length for a second. There are lots of different estimates when it comes to the average number of years between each generation, but I'm going to go with 30 years, which is a nice round number and is close to what most genealogists would suggest. So 20 generations would be 600 years. But instead of counting the years up, let's count them down from the year 2000. So this is the year, this is the generation number, and this is the number of ancestors we should expect to find at that point. So far, we've gone 20 generations. Let's go some more. By the time we get to 40 generations, which is when Charlemagne was around, our number has gone up to well over 1 trillion ancestors. By now, I hope you see that there's a problem. You see, the population of the entire world in the year 800 was only around 250 million people. So how can we have 1 trillion ancestors when there were only 250 million people? Well, we can't. Which leads me to the second principle. 
Principle number two is, as your family tree gets larger, you're going to start finding that the same people appear on different branches of your tree. Now, the word that usually pops into people's mind at this point is inbreeding, or perhaps even incest. But these words are not actually appropriate for what I'm talking about. Inbreeding and incest involve mating between very close relatives. An example of this would be Philip II of Spain from the House of Habsburg, who married his sister's daughter, his niece, and with her had a son who became Philip III. Philip III then married a close cousin, and then their son married a close cousin, and so forth. That's inbreeding, and not only is it gross, it's unhealthy. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about involves relatives that are a little more distant. For example, if you discover the name of a great-great-great-grandfather on your father's side of the family, and then discover that the same name also appears as a great-great-great-grandfather on your mother's side of the family, that means that your parents are third cousins. And there's a big difference between an uncle-niece marriage and a third cousin marriage. An uncle and a niece share a whopping 25% of their DNA in common. In contrast, third cousins share less than 1%, which is very close to being statistically irrelevant. Most people will be hard-pressed to name one or two of their second cousins, let alone a third cousin. So what this all means is that when calculating our number of ancestors, we cannot simply multiply two by two by two and so forth. We have to take into account the fact that throughout most of history, most people married a second, third, or fourth cousin. This is because most families lived in the same small village for generations, and therefore everybody was related to everybody somehow. I should also mention that first cousin marriages were generally not the norm, but they certainly weren't uncommon. So what genealogists have found is that as a family tree grows, its width gets bigger and bigger, but then at some point it stops and then it actually gets smaller and smaller. So let's recap what we've learned so far. After hearing about principle number one, you may have thought, wow, those numbers really add up fast. Therefore, it's really easy to imagine that everyone must be related. But when you heard about principle number two, you may have thought, oh, well, if most people marry distant cousins from their own village, the chances of two people from opposite sides of a continent being related must be very low. But there's still one more principle to discuss. Principle number three is the six degrees of separation principle. This principle is sometimes associated with the actor Kevin Bacon. There's a game you can play in which someone names an actor and the other person has to get back to Kevin Bacon in six steps or less. So for example, let's take the actor Charlie Chapman. Charlie Chapman was in a movie called The Great Dictator with Don Brody. Don Brody was in a movie called Murphy's Law with David Heyman. And David Heyman was in a movie called Where the Truth Lies with Kevin Bacon. So you can get from Charlie Chapman to Kevin Bacon in only three steps. According to the six degrees of separation principle, you should be able to make a connection between any two people living on Earth in six steps or less. Several studies using social media sites like Facebook or LinkedIn have provided evidence that in most cases, this principle is in fact true. Now, the reason why this principle works is not because everyone has lots of connections to all sorts of different people. No, most people have only a limited number of connections. However, everyone can usually get to a super well-connected person in one or two steps. And once you connect to a super well-connected person, you can then make giant leaps from one small network here to another small network over there. So when it comes to genealogy, even if most people stayed within their own small village and married within their own small village, there were always a few people that didn't. There were people who moved to the next town and still others who journeyed really far away. Factor in war, armies, and all the nasty stuff that goes along with it, you'll see that it doesn't take long for genetic connections to be made all across a continent. We can apply this same principle to royal families. You may think that since royal families in the past only ever married within the nobility, there was no possibility that royal blood could have trickled down to the level of the common people. But kings often had many children. The older, legitimate ones tended to marry really well, but the younger legitimate ones, as well as the many illegitimate ones, often married lesser nobles and then their children married even lesser nobles, and so on and so on. 
It was not uncommon for a line to go all the way from prince to pauper in just a few generations. Okay, so we know that our number of ancestors goes up exponentially, even if due to cousin marriages, we're not actually doubling it every generation. We also know that even though most people married someone who lived nearby and who belonged to the same social class, there have always been people who traveled far and wide, and people who produced children with someone richer or poorer than themselves. So when we take all of these things into consideration, make some models and use some fancy math, what conclusions can we reach? Once again, I'll remind you to check the links in the description if you want all the nitty gritty details. But basically, here's the conclusion. For the continent of Europe, you only have to go back 1,000 years to reach what is called the identical ancestors point. The identical ancestors point is the point in which every person of European descent has exactly the same set of ancestors. So if we were to go back to the year 1000 and remove the 20% of people who didn't have any children or whose lines died out completely after just a few generations, the remaining 80% are the common ancestors of every person of European descent living today. Let me put this in a few different ways so you can really grasp it. This is Jane. Jane lives in London in 2019. All of these people living in Europe 1,000 years ago, that 80% we just talked about, are her ancestors. She's a descendant of every single one of them. If we had perfect genealogical records, she'd be able to trace a direct line back to any one of them we choose. So she could trace her line to the King of England, the King of France, or the King of Hungary. But she could also trace her line to some simple farmer in Ireland, a lowly foot soldier in Poland, or the guy who swept floors of some church in Rome. And the same is true for Elsa from Stockholm, Vlad from Moscow, and even me, Matt Baker from Vancouver, Canada. So if we're talking about you, assuming you have at least one European ancestor, and Charlemagne, who lived even longer than 1,000 years ago, then yes, you are probably a descendant of him, even if you don't know the link. And again, if you have no European ancestors, don't worry. If you're Asian, chances are that you're related to royalty too. I'm not going to say to Genghis Khan because he lived less than 1,000 years ago, uh, but let's go with the great Chinese emperor Taizong of Tang. You're probably a descendant of him. And if you're from some other part of the world, you're likely related to some famous person from that region somehow. And the farther back in time we go, we can actually find an identical ancestor point, not just for a single continent, but for an even larger chunk of the world. So for example, the prophet Muhammad lived about 1400 years ago and is therefore likely the ancestor of every person now living in Europe, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, North America, etc. And if we go back even further to, let's say, Ramses the Great from Egypt, who lived over 3,000 years ago, he's probably the common ancestor of every single person on Earth. The only people who might not link in would be people from some very isolated tribe somewhere. But they're likely not watching this video anyway. Now, is this theory rock solid? No, there's no way to prove it 100%. And in fact, the genetic studies based on Europe do show some variation. For example, people living in Spain and Italy are a little less likely to be easily connected to everyone else within just 1,000 years. Perhaps that's because there are mountains between those regions and the rest of Europe. On the other hand, you can likely find a connection between all the people in France and Germany in less than 1,000 years, because those two countries are so close to each other and have had lots of interaction. So there you have it. According to the identical ancestors theory, we, as humans, are all connected one way or another. And it's very likely that you don't have to go back as far as you might think to discover that connection. If you're interested in finding out exactly how you might be related to royalty, stay tuned for next week's video, which will cover the topic, Finding Your Royal Roots. Thanks for watching.